Now, of course, I'm not going to um, talk about um, tearing down capitalism today, but feel free to do so. <laughs> so today, today I'm going to talk about uh, emergence in LARP and professor. Entropy, a uh, concept from thermodynamic physics, dictates that our universe gradually moves from states of order to states of disorder and chaos. Few media revel in the universe's uh, chaos as much as the medium of LARP. Our fictional realities are entropic. We play embodied characters in these realities, which produces a constantly shifting field of dynamics that not only move away from the initial game state, but also within and beyond the scope of designer intention. We create an intricate and densely structured latticework of character relationships, the exhibit A, only to have it descend into what Eric Fatlan calls the fog of LARP. The uncertain and unpredictable field of information and character emotion that is the standard game state of most LARPs. From the outside, the aesthetics of a LARP involve mainly just people milling about, chatting or miming. But from the inside, players are overloaded with information just navigating their character's subjective experience, let alone trying to comprehend all of the dynamics of the game as a whole. Then there's the game organizers looking at this whirlwind of act human activity with pride. Clearly, the LARP is running well. But what exactly is it that they're enjoying? I have no idea. I'd like to talk about that enjoyment, particularly the aesthetics of emergence in LARP. Uh, to emerge, the verb is to move out or away from something else. And we use this verb all the damn time, but mostly without any reflection of what it means. So this is just the start of putting words to our practice, and more of this, of course, could be found on the fabulous website, nordiclarp.org, in this year's Knudelpunkt book in uh, emergence iteration and reincorporation re re in LARP. Um, tonight, I'm just focusing on emergence. Now, last week, I ran the Arts Edge game uh, called Romeo and Juliet. Uh, it's a LARP created by Bianca Peterson and, and Lizzie Stark, among others. And the audience uh, was my game studies students. The LARP iterates upon Act 1, Scene 9 of the play, when Romeo and Juliet meet at a Capulet Ball. Uh, you play many, many varieties of this scene, and uh, some of them with altered emu emotional cues and others with altered power dynamics. Uh, this game excellently demonstrates how to do literary interpretation through LARP but that's not why I'm talking about it tonight. No, I'd like to talk about two other things, namely crab cakes and crystal meth. <laughs> so, this is not just an indulgent aside juxtaposing an, an hors d'oeuvre and a powerfully addictive stimulant. Rather, there are primary bits of, these are the primary bits of emergent fiction from the Romeo and Juliet game. It turns out that the servants needed something to serve the guests, so they settled on crab cakes as the main currency of the LARP, and they could actually withhold um, crab cakes from the guests they didn't like. Uh, Tybalt always was lusting for crab cakes. He, only, he never almost ha ever had any. Um, even when they switched characters, the crab cakes kept reappearing, and the crystal meth, on the other hand, was then the drug that they were doing in order to stay awake under the oppressive working conditions of the Capulets. Again, none of this ever appeared in any of the game um, written text. This resulted in a drug usage subplot that at one point led to a player physically keeling over to a fi due to a fictional meth overdose, which I'll then call b a divergent emergence later on. This came from wholly American and Midwest players injecting their humor and culture into the game through play. Now, how do we address these weird bits of fiction that, as indeed, uh, are natural components of a LARP's aesthetic system? Eric Fatland and Marcus Montala write of the brute force LARP design, driving so many blockbuster LARPs. So this is, of course, a, a uh, article I give to people who play College of Wizardry or, or New World Magiscal, and then they write me two days later being like, you just blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't read it, you should read it, just that's all. Um, it, so uh, basically, uh, the design is create a bunch of groups and subgroups with hierarchies and conflicting agendas, sow a bunch of in-game secrets among them as currency, and then throw in a bunch of puzzles and surprise events. And then they describes exactly what emerges, which is so-called plot trains and plot monopolies. You know what I'm talking about. 
events stampede over each other, uh, functional plot lines pushing aside malfunctional ones, and powerful characters with in-game secrets make opaque power plays that easily get confused on the ground. Right? Um, and this is not a critique. This is just how it works. That's what, what happens. Then there's the LARP domino effect, uh, uh, written by Sarah Lynn Bowman, which, um, and, and, and she calls it, I quote, uh, content from one area of the game spreading through the fiction like a wildfire as the result of emergent play. Again, this verb emerge keeps coming over and over again. She tells of how both players and organizers set these dominoes in motion, and how then perhaps uh, strategic spatial zoning of certain plot lines manages how the dominoes fall. But I think lurking in the shadows of both this brute force and dominoes model are assumptions that emergent fiction um, directly interacts with both uh, designer intention and player safety. So I'm starting there. There are other ways to analyze emergent fiction, but these are the ones I think we care about a lot. My own m model uh, is trying to appraise emergent play, and I think what we really want is uh, seeing if it's bo both unexpected, so it's not predictable, yet it fits the design and themes of the game as implicitly agreed upon between the players and the organizers, but does not escalate into dangerous physical, psychological, social, or legal territory. <laughs> the sweet spot of LARP. <laughs> I have developed a four-part taxonomy, big word, of emergence to address each uh, distinct moment of embodied LARP play as the game unfolds. And this, this system talks a little bit about bits of fiction, but really it makes no real difference between fiction and reality. Everything that happens in a LARP really is an event. So we first have cultivated emergence, which um, uh, this is this is emergent play that not only stays within the bounds of player safety, but directly coincides with the themes, tropes, and design intentions of the LARP. So this is a run staying inside the core imaginary of what the designers conceived. No crab cakes, uh, no drugs. Romeo and Juliet meet in various ways. The end. Now, uncultivated emergence. Is, call, is that um, emergent play that generally fits the, the themes and tropes of the LARP, but doesn't seem directly from the design, right? It's unexpected by all parties involved, but like the crab cakes, takes on then an important role for the players and demonstrates the impact of their imaginative free play while still holding to this agreed upon themes of the game. And of course, this is like a decadent noble party. I know it's a strats, but you know, nobles like hors d'oeuvres, okay? Then we have divergent emergence, which is when the emergent play actively distracts and diverges from the themes of the tropes of the LARP, um, but doesn't place anyone in harm's way. So that's when uh, the servant overdoses on crystal meth, complete, which completely derailed that round of the Romeo and Juliet run. Uh, we had to force a hold to see if the player was OK. Uh, and then the narrative became about this guy's drug problem. <laughs> Not the star-crossed lovers, OK? So then unleashed emergence is the classic depiction of play that actually gets out of hand regardless of fitting the design or themes and posing potential real life dangers to its players. This is a Romeo and Juliet player who hears the crystal meth re reference and pulls out his own supply. <laughs> this is... <laughs> This is when in-game bullying turns into actual bullying. This is when Tom Hanks goes into the maze in Mazes and Monsters. <laughs> that sort of thing. Maybe we need another example of all this, so I'm going to now apply it to a hypothetical LARP about worshiping and finally being destroyed by an unnamed goat god. <laughs> right. <laughs> The designer intention of the Goat Guard LARP is to have players safely, it's hypothetical, okay? <laughs> have players safely enjoy the hedonism of worshiping and being destroyed by the god. There are also implied themes here of decadence, betrayal, and decay. So a cultivated emergence instance would mean events that are generally pointing towards these themes and ultimately destroyed them. You get what you pay for, right? You know, that's, that's, that's the LARP. <laughs> now, <laughs> Uncultivated emergence would mean some sort of emergent fiction that, that meant, say, half the characters were just transformed into goats, like in the middle, maybe due to a spell or something. And it still sort of fits the theme of the LARP, but uh, um, not within the scope of the designer intention. <laughs> So then, divergent emergence in this situation means that in the heat of absolute decadence, and the players want to show this off, they really desire 
ice cream and for the best possible 360 degree illusion, therefore go out and the LARP to go get ice cream, which has absolutely nothing to do with the themes of this hypothetical LARP, but isn't really dangerous or anything. And of course, unleashed emergence would mean then that several players want to amp up their experience even further by con conducting a raid on the local goat farm next door, performing real and speakable acts on the animals illegally. <laughs> might I add. It's still a form of emergent play, so these people are no less playing, it's just a dangerous one, probably with unintended consequences. Now, I'm ending this by just saying this is one potential tool in a larger toolbox of LARP aesthetics, um, something, something that's reaching beyond specific genres, conventions, or national borders, and I'm doing this so we can really value our subjective sensory emotional experience of any LARP and look at larger patterns that we're now beginning to discern across genres. And this is the only beginning because the goat god has not come from Earth yet, but uh, the entropy continues. Thank you so much.